Hey everybody, it's Natalie McKenzie with The Whole Woman and it's six o'clock here on the East Coast and welcome to the very first episode of Living Life Authentically with yours truly, Natalie P. McKenzie. That's right, we have shifted gears, we welcome you over and we are excited to have you join us for Living Life Authentically where trust undergirds our communication. So we'll be talking with some just of the most amazing guests We'll keep that trend going. This month for the for February, we'll be talking about all things Black history. We'll be celebrating all the contributions of amazing Black Americans, African Americans, people of indigenous um, uh, background, and um, we're excited. So I hope you are too. Grab your tea or your martini. It's still welcome. We're still going to have something with you. I'm actually going to have a little tea today because I'm warming up. But ladies and gentlemen, as always, guess what? Our sponsors came with us. Today, we are wearing designs by none other than the wonderful Hope Wade Designs. Thank you, Hope Wade Designs, and welcome to Living Life Authentically. We are excited to continue our partnership with you. And yes, it's woman-owned and Black-owned. We buy Black, we celebrate Black, and we are celebrating our women. We like all our partners, but we especially celebrate those who are small businesses. So without further ado, remember we can find Hope at hopewaydesigns.com. We can go visit her in Nyack at her storefront on Main Street, or we can check her out on Instagram, on Facebook at Hope Wade on both pages. Without further ado, I'm excited. I get to talk with someone who I just had a little fangirl moment backstage and okay, you guys know me. I'll kind of say it if I'm thinking it because I'm just that kind of gal. Help me welcome our guest today. She's an author, educator, producer, and co-chairperson of the Malcolm X and Dr. Betty Shabazz Memorial and Educational Center. She is none other than Ilyasa Shabazz. Hi. <laughs> hello, 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 and welcome. Hello. I'm so excited to be with you today, especially I, your inaugural show. Yes, we are delighted. And I think it's quite an honor to have someone of your statue. And it's Black History Month. Hello. What is more important to America than the contributions we have all made? And how about we get to tell our own story so we can get it right? That's right. I'm, <laughs> I'm with you 100%. Um, you know, American history is Black history. That is right. It is the history of this country because if we really want to talk about when America started, how America started, how America was built, it was built by us. And so, but we'll give it to them one teaspoon at a time. How's that? Okay, one teaspoon at a time. But we do want to say that that we were here before Christopher Columbus. Absolutely. So, and, it, and the society was thriving but one teaspoon at a time. You know, I'm a girl from the islands. I'm from Antigua Bay, Jamaica. And boy, do we chuckle at the whole concept of having been discovered. <laughs> How do you discover something that was already occupied? But okay, so we get it. Right. And um, no, we were not blonde with um, pointy nose, et cetera. We were indigenous people. We were Aztecians, Ar um, Arawaks. We were Mayans, Incans. It's kind of more like you and I do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. My grandmother's from Grenada. Oh, fabulous. Okay, yeah. we have so much, so much, so much to learn, so much to catch up on. But Ilyasa, this is all about you today. We're so delighted to have you. And of course, it goes without saying, you are the daughter of Malcolm X and Dr. Betty Shabazz. What an honor, what a, what a privilege, and thank you for joining us. But tell me your story, not what I think I know. Tell you my story. Hmm, that's, that's, that's a broad question. So let's see, my story is I have five sisters, um, and I, no matter where I go, I always acknowledge my five sisters because my father was, almost six five, my mother was almost five nine, and they had tall daughters. And not just tall daughters, tall opinionated daughters. And so <laughs> I have to always make it known that I am not my parents' only daughter, but that they that they had six of us. And so we had a great childhood together. 
Um, my two older sisters just thought that the younger ones were just too young to hang out with them. So it was always me and the three little ones. And so we went to camp together. We went to my grandmother's together. We did a lot of activities together. Um, we saw the Wiz together, you know, so I, I had a really wonderful childhood. Thanks to Dr. Betty Shabazz. So here we are, you know, we, we have this, each of us have our own opinion of who or what a Malcolm X was. And, you know, we think he was this militant person and geez, what kind of a dad must he have been? Or how did he influence your life? But Tell us about growing up the daughter of Malcolm X and about being the daughter of Dr. Betty Shabazz. Well, you know, that's really funny because, you know, what we should always remember is the challenges that our grandparents, our great grandparents, <laughs> that we have had, right? And so my father fought against those kinds of challenges. He had a profound reaction to injustice. He had a profound reaction to violence. And so he did not want to see his family um, mistreated, disrespected, uh, brutalized, all the things that were happening. And as much as he didn't want to see his family uh, treated that way, he didn't want to see his people or any human beings treated that way. And it all began with the self-love and, 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 and having the capacity to not see things from a black and white perspective, but the capacity to see right from wrong. Mm. A human perspective. That's right, yeah. And so um, Ilyasa, we know that your life was interrupted and your father was just brutally ripped away from your family unexpectedly, but talk with us a little bit about the events leading up to that and then the loss of your dad. What was the, and, and at what point of your life did this all happen? Well, okay, so we were all babies. My older sister was six, then was four, I was two, Gamila was just born, my mother was pregnant with twins. Mm -hmm. And um, on February 14th, the night of Valentine's Day of all oh. nights, my mother and father were in bed sleep and a bomb was thrown into the nursery of our home where the baby slept. And, and I know for my father, you know, he said something like, it's one thing to chase me down, to um, you know, follow me, to poison me. It's one thing to do these things, but now you're throwing bombs into my baby's room and how ruthless, right? And so one week later, my mother witnessed, and we were all there, but very young, my father's assassination. And for me, you know, I remember being older and just asking my mother because she was only in her 20s. Her husband was 39. And she was not quite 30. They were uh, 10, 9, 10, or 11 years apart. I can't even remember. Uh, they were 11 years apart. And, you know, and I just always wonder, like, how was she able to not only take care of herself, but to take care of her six babies and safeguard the legacy of her husband, who had been, I mean, it had been absolutely tarnished. Because I think a lot of people write. Right. I, you know, we, we talked about this in our pre-show. And so here I go with my ignorance. Huh? Everybody knows this. I'm Jamaican. And so I grew up in what was a new, a new independent, newly independent country. And so we're still very influenced by colonization. And I remember in my very early formative years that Dr. Martin Luther King was the savior and Malcolm X was the bad guy. And he was just a militant. And so as I got older, I realized, wait a minute, that's your version because you were frightened by the fact that he was getting traction in demanding this equal equality and equity, you know? So go on, it's your story, but right. that, yeah. imagine the thought. Right. Well, you know, we feel mis absolutely misinformed about who Malcolm is, right? Um, there are, my father is quoted 53.7 thousand times per hour in social media. And so this is the clearest evidence that young people want to know the truth about Malcolm because they realize they have been misinformed. Absolutely. And I think when you start seeing, you know, these brutality, I mean, all of the killings that we've witnessed while 
self-quarantining that, you know, you want to know the truth about who was this person that, that gave the biggest critique of America. And so they're looking for leaders who, who are wise and who speak truth and whose works provide them with insight, strategies and tactics that they can employ to meet the systemic challenges head on. Well said. And I think you've really encapsulated there. And I'm telling you, what we're seeing is these Gen Z and these millennials are going to hold our feet to the fire. They are galvanizing and they're galvanizing across race, religion, and creed. And that's where the power is. That's right. That's right. And, and you know, we have to, to uh, give them kudos and, and just say that we stand with you because, uh yes, they organized... I mean, just think, over the summer, the Black Lives Matter movement, there were participants of all ethnic backgrounds, of all nationalities in this country in 50 states and abroad, and abroad. In countries. That's right. Yeah. And if that doesn't tell you you have a true movement that's going nowhere but forward, then be get ready because this is not gonna die. Right. So, so tell me, Eliasa, to be so young, to have your father rip, ripped away, you've got all these young children and a child bride with the, you know, a young woman as who's expecting to have a husband. She didn't start out as a single mother. How did she manage to keep life as normal as possible for you? And what was it like growing up? Where did you go to school? Tell us about that. Uh, you know, I, I'm honestly, I don't know how my mother did it. Um, so she had six daughters. She made sure that we learned about the significant contributions that women made to the world, the significant contributions that Africa, the diaspora, and the indigenous people made to the world, and the significant contributions um, that Islam made to the world. So we grew up with a very solid sense of who we were, with a strong identity and lots of self-love. And, and so I came to understand that my mother wanted to make sure that we loved ourselves so much that we did not rely on others to determine our self-worth, but that we already knew it. And then that we saw ourselves as a reflection of others so that it was this real human family. And you know, even with my students, even when I lecture, um, even with people in general, that just as much as I love me, I love you. And it's easy for me to do that because my mother taught us how to love. And you know, yeah, I, I, pardon me, Ilyasa, because yeah. the mental image, the programming that had been put into us is Malcolm X was this angry man. And, le and let's just look, look at that. Look at these atrocious acts that have been happening to us since slavery. Mm -hmm. Who does that? Do you see the metal pieces that they put on their necks with these things sticking out? The metal pieces that they put on their faces, the metal that they put on their mouth, and then put hot stuff in it. It was, com it was torturous. It was trauma, you know? And I, for the life of me, when people used to ask me questions about my father, I was like, my father had a profound reaction because he had such compassion and mm -hmm. such love for his people. And he had faith in our humanity and, 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 and the relationships that we have with one another, you know? And so of course, if he saw people being a fire hose, you know, that makes your skin off. Who wouldn't have a visceral reaction to that? Yes, and, and, and a person that does has to be a person of a person of extreme compassion and a person that's willing to put their life on the line for the betterment of all of ours. And and that is the reason why my father is is quoted fifty three point seven thousand times per hour in social media by this young generation who's learning the truth about Malcolm because they realize Malcolm spoke truth and truth is timeless. Malcolm was an extremely wise man, so they listened to him to employ his strategies and tactics so that they can also confront these injustices head on, because it's the only way it's going to end. You, you, 
Ilyasa, I know you're over at the Memorial and Educational Center for in honor of both your parents. And I'm, I'm curious as to how you ended up there. How is it you decided that's what you wanted to do? Because yes, you're the daughter, one of one of six daughters. Yes, you lived it. Yes, you, you're all about truth, but you could have decided to do so many other things. Tell me about your way, how you got to being where you are today. Well, you know, I'm also very compassionate, right? And I realized that, um, you know, when I was going to the master's school, right, not too far away was um, the Graham home, I think. It was, it was a, a locker facility for young people. And we would go and mentor them and, uh, on different subjects. I was mentoring them on math. But I started to realize that there were so many young uh, people of color who, who just seemed empty. And I didn't really understand it. And, 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 and you know, the older that I got and the more aware that I became, I started to realize that our educational curriculum was defunct of truth and that it was just so many terrible things and um, so fast forward, my mother meant everything to me. And I knew that she was protecting her husband's, safeguarding her husband's legacy to ultimately retire at the Shabazz Center. And when she passed away, I went and I did all the things I thought that she would want to do herself. And um, so I'm, I, you know, I'm a co-chairperson at the Shabazz Center. We have a great, um, a director of institutional advancement. I'm not at the Shabbat Center right now. <laughs> I'm in my office, but I love my mom and dad so much. I have pictures of them on my wall, pictures of my family, pictures of Maya Angelou, Auntie Coretta Scott King, all of these really wonderful people that had been in our lives, you know, through childhood that give me strength and courage and all that other stuff. You know, it's interesting because you mentioned the master's school and, you know, we, again, with our very limited, ignorant and skewed information on who you, you all are, the master, master school, like, wait a minute. So you're having an integrated education and, you know, because again, the stereotype would think everything was militant and you were isolated and you were only doing things because... That's the misinformation that is out there. Um, tell us about how you navigated your way through your young adult life, your, your teenage years. Well, you know, I had a great childhood. Um, again, you know, I, I spent summers in Vermont at a camp um, that promoted um, indigenous people, Quaker values. Um, and we got to swim and horseback ride and do all these archery, all these really great activities, climb all these mountains. And um, and then I would come home and go to school and go to my grandmother's in Philadelphia during, you know, with my uncles who were so overprotective. Anytime we even looked at a boy, they were, you know, right out in front of us, not allowing anyone near us. But, you know, I navigated my way through my young years until I went to college. And that is where people, you know, now there were more it was a small percentage, but it was a lot, lot more than my high school. I think my mother kept us in this bubble because she witnessed her husband's assassination, her home being firebombed. And so she was extremely protective and entitled to raise us the way she chose, right? And she, she chose to provide her girls with the quality education. And it just so happened that people who went to these schools, who could afford these schools were pri primarily white. Today, that's changed. Um, but when I was growing up, that's just the way it was until I went to college. And I chose my college. Well, really, my mother chose my college because I wanted to go to school where there were other Blacks. And I was so excited. And um, I was so friendly and naive. And um, and people were like, you're Malcolm X's daughter. And I'm like, yes. <laughs> but I didn't know what that meant. It was, like, frightening. <laughs> I didn't know what that meant until I called my oldest sister and I was like, Attila, what am I supposed to do? And she was like, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to pass the test. You already are Malcolm's daughter and whomever you are is good enough. So, oh, wow. okay. It didn't happen that easy, but, but you know, that's what he gave you. Right. you. You mentioned your grandmother a few times. Now, is this your maternal or paternal grandmother? From Grenada? Yes. 
my father's mother. Now, and this is just the misinformation about Malcolm. My father's, fa so Malcolm's father, Reverend Earl Little, right, was a, a, a Baptist minister. He was also the chapter president of the Universal Negro Improvement Association, founded by Marcus Garvey from Jamaica. From Jamaica. Okay. And his mother was the recording secretary, really smart, educated, brilliant, brilliant woman, spoke several languages. When you have two activist parents, you make sure that your children can navigate through Jim Crow and every other kind of horror, terror, that or anything that challenges your identity. Mm -hmm. And so his father, I'm gonna say this real fast, his father purchased land on property that was reserved for whites. Oh, they resented that. Because here you have big, tall, you know, proud men. Absolutely. And everyone said that his father was invincible, you know? And and they lynched him. They a mob, they lynched him. Oh. And then the mother, um, uh, recording secretary for this organization, she's clearly smart, right? Seven years later, they put her in an institution and they take their land. Oh they break yeah. up the family. And so one of my books is if you have if a child has no guidance no parents right and 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 not that village that we know it takes to raise a child that's right. right there's so many things that can happen to our children and that's why it is important that we continue to protect our children whether we biologically birth them or not and so for my father he was running he was running from himself he was running from his identity. Well, the system made him an orphan. That's right. That's Ripped right. him from a loving, stable family That's and right. made him an orphan. Right. I did not know this. Again, I have no problems when I don't know something. I'll say it with with um, with no pride. So, um, Ilyasa, you've authored about five or six books. Tell us the names of each of your books and tell us where we can find your books. All my books should be on Amazon or whatever, you know, online mm -hmm. you know, um, or any bookstore if, you know, if you want to go out and see <laughs> where you mask. Um, so my first book was Growing Up X. Um, it's coming of age memoir. Um, and then I have um, Malcolm Little, the boy who grew up to become Malcolm X. It's a children's book. And they're all award winning books. Um, and then uh, Betty Before X. Um, really great middle school book about self, you know, just, it's a beautiful, I love the book, um, Betty Before X. I love that. There's X a novel. It's a young adult book about Malcolm's adolescence. You know, when our children, for Malcolm to be, uh, uh, for Malcolm to be the top of his class um, in his and class president of the seventh grade and his teacher, favorite teacher said, what do you want to be when you grow up? He said a lawyer because that's when he saw his father defending the rights of people, right? Mm -hmm. He was really smart, obviously because he was class president and his teacher said, that's not a realistic goal for an N. And you know, the N word, yeah, you to think of using your hands. And that's much like saying black lives don't matter. Absolutely. That's what happens subconsciously to our children mm -hmm. because they receive this information that says we're less than, we're not worthy. How right? dare you dream? Right, and and even not to have our history included in our national educational curriculum, right? Says that you're not worthy, right? And so, um, X a novel speaks to that. That when our young people are are in pain, they don't say, "Let me get a good education." They usually drown it out with drinking, drugs, anything, loud music, right? Um, right. And then just recently I released uh, The Awakening of Malcolm X, which goes into more uh, depth and clarity of his family and, um, and, and criminal justice system. I have a quote here where um, there are approximately three million people in our nation's prison today, um, while only 32 percent of the U.S. population is African-American and Latinx. 56% of the incarcerated population is people of color. In 2012, the U.S. spent 81 billion taxpayer dollars on correction facilities, not schools, not after-school programs, 
but on correction facilities since 1970, the incarcerated population has increased by 70, 700%. So, Ilyasa, you're hitting something that we t we talked about today on our podcast, and today's podcast covered race and education. And exactly what you've talked about, what you've just mentioned, is exactly what we're talking about. We're investing so much in our prison system, taking resources from our education system, and preparing our young men and young boys. It's our, our public schools are pretty much pipelines to the prisons instead of pipelines to colleges. And um, so there is a real systemic issue here. And I'm hopeful that this administration may actually get some progress done because I know our youth are going to hold them accountable, yes. not because they're such good people, but because this movement that's taking place is gonna hold us accountable all of us, and That's we right. have to do better. That's right. All your books are available on Amazon. They're available where books are sold. I encourage everyone to go out and get them. When we get off, I will be adding them all to my library because just in talking with you, I, I did not realize how ignorant I am about Malcolm X and the real story. So Ilyasa, you are also a, um, a you also advised over at PBS um, on the making of movies and, and, and on different subject matters. Let's talk about how you're using your knowledge, your education, and your passion to impact today's society and cause change. Well, listen, if, you know, it's really about the education curriculum, right? Um, if the terrorism of mm -hmm. slavery and the subsequent massacres of black people in Tulsa, Oklahoma and Rosewood, Florida, for example, is taught in high school US history classes to be as American as the Boston Tea Party, then our education would be based on truth, historical facts, and more citizens would understand the necessity for reparation, right? We'd have the opportunity to make sure that our children are learning truth and human compassion. And if in world history classes, the truth that Africa is the cradle of the most advanced civilization ever right. to exist in mankind, and the impressive kingdoms of Futajello, Benin, Ghana, Mali, Egypt got even half the attention that Greece and Rome do, then all of us might appreciate the present complexity of black civilizations in Africa without learning hate and discrimination, but instead learning love, respect for ourselves and for humanity. And so the, all of the projects that I work on, whether they're books, whether they're film, whether they're productions, has to do with ensuring that we are leaving a, um, the right image for our children, that we are leaving the truth of, of our history, that we are providing an, an identity for our children, just as my mother and my father did for me. It, I feel that it is my duty to make sure that I can leave it for as many people as possible. And we have so many great um, other others, you know, producers, film writers, and so forth that are doing the same thing. And 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 even people like you and Deetra and you know your whole production team, you guys are doing a wonderful job. Um, and so you know, Eliasa, it's interesting because if the true if history were being taught in its entirety. If we truly taught African-American history, the phrase, the movement, Black Lives Matter, would not, there is no way anyone could find it offensive because, <laughs> because you would recognize that it has not mattered. It did not matter. It was squished out, stumped out, firebombed out, murdered out. And that is why people are getting up and saying, please, sir, would you kindly take your foot off my neck? I can't breathe. That is absolutely right. That is absolutely right. And my father said, if you stick a knife in my back, nine inches and pull it out six, six inches, there's no progress. If you pull it all the way out, that's not progress. The progress is healing the wound that the blow made. Mm. And so we have to understand that so that next time no one says to me, well, I thought your father was violent. Mm. Really? <laughs> right? 
I mean, violent. What, 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 my, and as my mother said, her husband was never involved in anything, any violence. You know, he was kind, he was loving, he was compassionate. He put his life on the line to give his people shock treatment because it, it had not been that far from slavery, the time in the 60s, in the 50s when he lived. Well, you know, in the 60s, the 50s, as you and I both know, it was the extension of slavery because peonage was was alive and well, but Jim Crow. That's right. That's right. It was. You know, so it's it's a, it's a sad thing. So in Lassa, as you continue a lot, I, I'd say this with the greatest respect that I see you as carrying on your father's work. Um, you know, as women, we get to be so kind and gracious and smile and be beautiful, but still say the same thing and not be so threatening. Um, and I think you're doing it so effectively. Um, tell me more about some of the things you do, because you are so much more than this conversation we're having here. Um, well, you're, I'm you're so been, you know, a couple of, uh, a couple, I'm in the deltas, the links, you know, with my my mother and I was with my mother. She was one of the charter members, and I came into the founding a group of the Greater Hudson Valley Chapter Links Incorporated, and, <laughs> and of course Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated because my mother just loved her um, sisterhood, and I'm finding the same and and the importance, you know, of that kind of sisterhood, you know, where you can address these issues, these community issues, these societal issues, these global issues. Um, my father said a society is measured by the progress of its women. And we can see that. When you teach a boy, you teach a community. When you teach a woman, a girl, you raise a nation. And so, you know, we see um, just the value, you know, like Stacey Abrams, yes. like so many others, you know, we see the value in our work. Had it not been for Stacey Abrams and her crew. Oh boy. Listen, they helped deliver the Democratic <laughs> victory, right? Whoever whomever thought the state of Georgia would go blue. I mean, come on. We would all think hell would have frozen, but you know, <laughs> almost did. <laughs> Ilyasa, I have a question for you. And here I go with my ignorance again. Malcolm X, a giant of a man. How do you end up Shabazz and not X? <laughs> That's, a good That's so funny. Um, I know a lot of people are like, um, is your last name X? And I'm just like, okay, come on, really? Not in 2021, you're going to ask me that question. I used to get that question, uh, you know, when I was younger. But so my father dropped his last name Little because he said, that was our slave name. And that slave name meant that we could not trace our heritage because right. I mean, my gosh, just look. I mean, these are the kinds of things that happen to us. And these post-traumatic syndrome of slavery, right? Um, and so he dropped the, the last name Little because it meant that he could only trace it back to the plantation, that, right? And, be, and they adopted the last name X to mark the unknown. So it didn't let them off the hook for what they'd done to us, right? By taking our identity, culture, heritage, just all of these things. And um, when my father uh, made his Hajj, uh, his name, he was given the name Shabazz, Shabazz, um, you know, meaning so many things, mighty, eagle. Um, and so I was born with, well, I don't know if I was born with Shabazz, but my name on my, my birth certificate, as I know it, um, is Ilyasa Shabazz. I just had to ask that question. Because, yeah. you know, my, father, my father actually said that he would keep the name X until his people were free. Ah. He would go by the name X, but his name on his passport was El Haj Malik Shabazz. And there was nothing little about Mr. Malcolm. So I'm with him. Describe that name. <laughs> Not at all. But my mother said, I was like, Mommy, how come you didn't remarry? She said, I, who, who, was, who was I going to marry after my husband? Oh, Lord, I love it. It's very clear that she had the best. And she would let me know that all the time. She said, I had the best, Ilyasa. And I said, I know. 
<laughs> That's beautiful. Unfortunately, Ilyasa, we're out of time. I could sit here and chat with you the entire time, but it's Black History Month and I couldn't think of a better person to be educated by. And it's also our very first podcast. I thank you so much. You are a giant of a woman. You are a beautiful woman. You are a kind and compassionate woman and you're what I would consider the whole woman. So we thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. How can we get into stay in touch with you? How do we follow you? Get information on the um, educational center. So my um, Instagram, I probably am the most active on my Instagram. Um, Instagram and all of my other social media handles is at Ilyasa Shabazz, and um, uh, the Shabazz Center is at the Shabazz Center. And um, I always repost everything from the Shabbat Center. Fabulous. So we're going to stay in touch with you by following you up with, at the Shabbat Center. We can find you on Facebook and on Instagram at the Shabbat Center. And it's Ilyasa Shabazz on Instagram. That's her handle. Ladies and gentlemen, I am Natalie B. McKenzie. And I am your host of your inaugural episode of living life authentically. Now remember, we have a deal. When we leave this platform, we go over to mochapodcastnetwork.com and we'll listen in to today's new podcast where we're discussing all things race and education with Dr. V Gregory Vincent and Ilham Askia. I thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to seeing you soon. And again, I'm Natalie B. McKenzie, and I wish you enough life to live, enough joy to give, enough love to share. I wish you enough. Good night. <laughs>